And thank you to everyone for joining our first webinar. Today's talk on machine learning assisted test subsetting and reordering will be led by none other than Kosuke Kawaguchi, Launchable's co-founder and co-CEO. Kosuke is well known for creating Jenkins, a popular open source CI tool I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Kosuke is passionate about solving problems that developers face every day. Previously, as a CTO of CloudBees, he helped create the enterprise Jenkins business and grew the team to over 400 people before starting his next adventure. Launchable. He is an O'Reilly Open Source Award recipient, a Java One Rockstar, and a Rocketon Technology Award recipient, to name a few. And today, he's excited to introduce you to Launchable. So before we get started, please remember to log your questions in the Q&A section, and we'll answer those at the end of the call. Over to you, Kosuke. All right. Well, well thank you very much for the introduction. It's, a, it's, it's good to have a real MC. Um, so, um, yeah. So, you know, once, once upon time before, you know, all of us got like stuck at home, which now feels like I saw it such a long time ago. Um, you know, being a Jenkins creator and being this, like, a part of the executive team, so Clavis, I got a privilege of traveling around the world. And then one of the things I did enjoy doing was to, you know, drop off, I drop into some random software development teams and then kind of hear them out on how they are, you know, working on software development and what drives them and so on and so forth. So, you know, because, uh, and then that, you know, I do those two, two hour conversations and like in which people, you know, surprisingly many people open up and tell me all sorts of, you know, things that's going on. And what you find is like, if you go to these conferences and like talk, hear from um, technology visionaries or vendors and, or the company who seems to be nailing it, you, you feel like, like everyone is like moving very, very, gracefully and beautiful and like you know, at the whole new different world that doesn't resemble the world you're in. But if you actually go out to talk to people where they are, you see like what's happening under the surface, right? Like a people are trying to like a puddle madly and then like it's mess and like a duct tapes and uh, rubbers all over the places and like the water is leaking from here and there. Um, and that's true from, you know, Silicon Valley to the real world. And, in some sense, like when the business is successful, right? Like they can't afford to quote unquote do the right thing engineering wise. So, you know, they are in some sense like a become a victim of their own success. And then, uh, you know, fast forward 10 years from outside, they look like amazing success. And you would think like they must have nailed it, but inside, like people are almost like, you know, they're snow faced and dead. So, um, so that in, in that, you know, I, I think. I, I've done many dozen conversations like that, and I started noticing some really common themes. Right? That is, I think many of the vocal voices in the world are more aspirational, big transformations, you know, like a rewrite to the code, like a whole new mindset, the culture, all of that's taking, you know, like a fuzzy things and lots of time and uh, like, you know, somewhat invisible return from the beginning. But really, like the challenges that people are facing are more mundane and boring and unsexy, and they need somewhat more immediate solutions. And then there are many of these things, but the one that I sort of really started appealing to me was this notion of um, this, this idea that it's really the tests or the broader sense, the quality, or like, you know, that is taking time. Like producing change, the code is actually not too hard, especially if you're making incremental changes, which for any established projects, that's what you do. But um, as a project gets bigger, the longer, um, then you know, like building up enough confidence to that one line change you made, um, that is the painful, time-consuming part. Um, and this theme I saw it over and over again in so many teams. It's made complete sense to me, uh, in part because you know I've also been there. Right, like I worked on this popular open source project, and you know, let's say this has been a pretty big, long, long-running project. So uh, we got to the point where, you know, like if I make a one-line change to the system, um, like it, you know, and I create a pull request, and it runs a one hour worth of the unit tests, um, and then only after that is successful, some other people, you know, friendly colleagues who come in and um, do the code review, and then maybe they want my, me to change the variable name and like I change this access or whatever. And then I make a small trivial follow-up change and it's like the whole hour of the testing needs to run again. Um, and then you know, what are you gonna do for that one hour, right? Like it's just 
it's not long enough to really cleanly context switch to something else, but it's also short enough not to like to short enough. You can't really do meaningful like side work. So in, in some sense, like I never felt like I could completely cleanly move on from one to another. And you know, people are not good at multitasking, including myself. So um, as we started looking at this kind of problem more carefully, um, I think the sort of we, we crystallized this. QA confidence building challenges into these five different key problems. And then, you know, I, I know most of us here, engineers and developers, I, I, I hope that it resonates with all of you. So, you know, what I started talking about is this slow test feedback time, right? Like I make a change and in some sense, I'm waiting for some tests to fail to guide my next leg of the cleanup work. You know, I want to rinse and repeat the process until everything is passing. Um, so that the time it takes to get that information is pretty crucial, and you know one hour is pretty bad. But you know, you, again, I think many of you know that in in bigger software projects, like it could get far far worse. Uh, the company I used to be before that, you know, we had a test suite that takes like a whole week to run. So like you know, imagine like if you catch some problem there and then need to work on the fix and verify that. Um, the second challenge I think is also pretty common is, is what I call the QA investigation detective work. So this happens especially through with the test that's happening in the middle or the right of the software development process um, in which you know, the, the changes from multiple people get patched in and then run against a whole bunch of tests. So when they fail, usually like some people need to try out those failures, decide if it's a test case problem or the code problem. And if it's a code problem, Whose change was caused by it? Um, that, you know, this, this, this is commonly seen in big integration places, um, or, or quite often see dedicated people. You know, those are truly thankless jobs, uh, but nonetheless important work that needs to be done to chase after some people and, hey, I think your change broke things. And of course, like, you know, sometimes you're wrong, and then like, they push back, and like, how dare you screw like, you know, how, how dare you call me? Like, uh, uh, and then uh, the, all the nastiness is ensues. The third problem is, you know, the amount of test workload, if you think about it, is sort of grow cubic, right, say, to the scale of the project. So, you know, they, that, the reason I say that is, they add the, you, know, you, you keep writing tests. So, you know, in some sense, that the, the, test, the amount of test workloads grow linearly to the life of the project. Um, and, you know, the, the longer projects, they also, um, mass more developers. So the part of the volume of the test that also linearly depends on the number of people involved in the project and that also grows. And finally, the amount of test execution happens is also linear to the number of people who are working at the moment. So that in my mind is like a global combit like a cubic to the decided the project. So sooner or later, um, you get to the point where you have too many tests and too many changes coming in and it's simply not possible, even with the power of the cloud. And even if you can throw a lot of money at the problem, you just won't be able to run every test on every changes. So now, you know, people start to deploy in heuristics. Okay, like let's create a nightly test, like weekly test. You know, I'm going to create a smoke test and move things left and right and so on. But um, you know, that's that that creates that you know, that those things never get done scientifically. It's just like a gut feeling and intuitions. So. You know, that that always creates a room for improvement. And the fourth problem is all the flakiness. Um, I think we all, again, we, I think we all been there, right? Like you're young, so like naively you start from the place of like, oh, we, we should be able, if you work hard enough, you should be able to eliminate flaky tests. And then you spend like enough time at it. And then, you know, you get old enough to realize that you can never truly get rid of those. So now you kind of have to tame those. But if you know, left unattended, it could create so much noise and then that varies the useful signal and that truly um, destroy, that could destroy the confidence to the testing. And then if that happens, it's really hard to come back from it. So I know for sure that this happens in many, many places. And last bit is um, this, I think the prevailing thoughts of wisdom, um, and that is right at a certain point, it is just throw more machines at the program, right? Let's just parallelize, let's just you know, create more EC2 instances or whatever uh, to get to keep up with the workload until you know until that becomes not okay. Right? And then I you know in Jenkins project we had this problem too. We um 
you know, we thought it, you know, in the grand scheme of things, the, the workload that's happening there is not too big. Uh, but that that could easily, you know, we added up to about like a 10k, 15k per month. And then while we have a free sponsorship, that was okay. But then when that lapsed and we actually had to pay for it, then suddenly this huge thing to drop and we I need to scramble. And I, I felt that one very personally because that was on my credit, on credit card. So, um, you know, that was just that was really painful. Uh, but anyway, so I think all, all of these problems in my mind really stem from the fact that, um, um, that uh, uh, the data, well, that, that we are not using the data that we could use. Like I, you know, I, one of the things I felt was, you know, as a as a guy who invented Jenkins, I pushed. I felt I'm proud that I pushed automation forward in the world, and now all of that automation is producing lots of data about the tests and test executions. And I felt like if I could use, I could use those informations and then like try to make some dent in these problems. So the, I think the key concept um, that I'm trying to, uh, that we are pushing to help people see the light uh, is this notion of time to force failure. And that is the idea that you know, at one point in time, you introduce a commit uh, in, the, in the source tree, let's say create a pull request. And then you know, it goes up and then some process of automation happens. And at some point you get the failure. And then you know, what I'm trying to call out is the fact that the first time to the first failure is particularly of the particular importance, not time to get to the test results. Because as soon as you have some you know, first failure as a developer, you get, to, you get to work on some stuff, right? So if you know, the, the, the breakthrough or like a key, key insight to me was, it's not necessarily important that we reduce the total running time of this. Like so long as we can pull in the first failure and then get that meaningfully to the developer, then we can make a significant impact. So the, yeah, the natural idea uh, was, you know, let's look at, you know, if you have all these tests, let's look at, let's, let's try to predict like which tests are more likely to fail. And as a developer, like instinctively you'd think in a large system, if you're changing a small part of the big system, not all tests are equally meaningful, probably. Right? There's like, I don't think it's difficult to imagine there are small subset of the tests that are more sensitive to the change you made. And it, you know, that if we just don't know what these changes, those tests are in meaningful ways. So we just run those tests in more or less random order. But if you can you know, the, put some probability weight to those test cases, then we can reorder the test execution um, so that the more highly probable test would run first, for example, like the test that previously failed. Um, and then we, but even better, so then that would drastically reduce this time to force failure. Um, and furthermore, we could take the next step and say, well, maybe if these tests are such a low probability to have a, maybe these tests have such a low probability of failure, we don't even need to perhaps run them. Um, and then that can save, you know, can free up those time and resources to, to do more meaningful, meaningful things. So that's the, that's the adaptive subset that we call. So the key insight is like, we should be able to do this um, by looking at the, what has changed in the source tree. So, you know, let's, let's sort of like dig a little bit deeper into how we achieve that. Um, so in luckily speaking, we have two data that we use. Like one, one set of data comes from the Git commit graph, which sort of like tells the entire picture of like how the system has evolved, what have changed. Um, and then we haven't progressed, or, well, at least we haven't figured out the point of looking at the actual diff or understanding the programming language structure. You know, like there's most of, lots of companies don't want other companies to, to be playing with their source code at that level. But what we did find was by looking at somewhat more aggregated information, like just looking at the number of line changed, what kind of files are modified, the pace in which things are modified, like without looking at actual content, we could do a lot of things. Um, and then, so that's the, that represents a Git commit graph. And on the other side, uh, we look at the test execution results, right? So if, let's say, imagine like a, a system like Jenkins amass this large amount of this information, the triplet that is the, the exactly what commit of the software under test being tested. And then what this test case run that either passed or failed and they took this much amount of time. 
Uh, so those are all like most pretty basic sediment information. Um, and then we start from there and then we, we sort of reprocess these raw data into the form that's really more amenable and is suitable for the processing. So one is what we call delta, that is at least the intuitive way to think about it is, is what has changed from the previous time the tests have run? Like what, what has changed against the baseline? Um, and then we already talked some of those, like what, are, what we think might have some, you know, instinctively some values, you know, the, 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 was this a C file? So is this like a markdown files? Is this file actively being modified or only a few people are touching it? Um, which part of the big source tree does this come from? You know, you could imagine, I think reasonable people can imagine like this would have some predictable power. And then the other side we are looking for is the test behavior change. So, you know, the, what tests started fading, right? So the idea is like when we, so between those, we have enough data what well, this would start to paint the picture. Um, it's that the, given the Delta, um, when this file, when this part of the source file changed in this way, these test cases started fading. And then we trained the model from there and then now we are trying to make the model predict that given a new delta in the test case, what is the chance of the test behavior change? What is the probability that this test would fail? Uh, and then we use that information to figure out the best order to run the tests. Um, and then this actually involves a number of factors. It's not just probability of the failure, like there are other things like test durations. Sometimes it makes sense to prefer a shorter tests, even if they are less likely to fail, uh, because you can just pack so many of them in small amount of time. Whereas like expensive time consuming tests really need to be worthwhile to get scheduled. And of course, there's also often some ordering constraints like you know, before or after set up here then that needs to be honored. Uh, but those are just all in some sense like a minor minor uh, hair, hair on top of this main thing. Um, so the, the intuition is like we, expe we expect and hope that the model we learn interesting correlation between Delta and, and the test behavior change. So, you know, like one would expect like if the markdown files are changing, it's probably less risky change than the source file changes or the, maybe the make file change. Um, and we also think, you know, like if, this subsystem in the source tree changes, these are the other, these are the tests that's probably gonna be useful. In some programming language, there's some like a parallel overlaying structure between unit tests and the source code. We hope that the model would pick up those things. You know, like if the, I think the same person touching the same file a lot of times, it probably have a likely different, uh, the failure probability than a lot of people touching this busy file that everyone is depending on. So, you know, the beauty of this is like, we, in some sense, like we can give them all the materials, raw materials without necessarily needing to like a fine screen, what things they would, what thing the model would pick up, it's just that the model would pick up the right intuitions. Um, and then, so that seems to be what's happening. Now, in some sense, like what we tell people is like, you know, it's, it's not exactly important, like how this model work in, in inside like for, for all we care it could be somebody behind like Amazon mechanical truck doing it for us. Uh, what matters is like you know what comes out of this prediction. So you know how we evaluate the model, I think this is worth also talking about a little bit. So um, so the idea is like we basically simulate like what what happens, right? So we use like once we collect lots of test sessions in which the what the tests and their executions are known. But we set aside certain amount of that to you know to evaluate the model. So you know take a take a test session that the model hasn't seen before, but you know we know what, what commit has tested, was tested, what tests were run, their actual result, and all that stuff. So we first obviously let the model sort the list of tests to the you know, to the preferred order. You know, we always we we want to be running all tests like not missing anything. And then uh, we check the, we review the answer and check them. Uh, again, we know which one of these actually passed and failed. So in any given order, uh, then we could compute like you know, how long this predicted order took until we find the first test case that did allow developers to start working on things. And that's the that's the time metrics that we care, right? 
Um, so if you do it, you know, we obviously do it not just with one test session, but many of those. And in some of the, those, we get really lucky. Um, and then so we'd be able to move those force failure really uh, close to the top. Sometimes you get unlucky, you know, like um, then we, 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 we ended up, let's say maybe there's just only one failure in the whole thing and it's happening relatively late in the game. So if you stack them up from the lucky to unlucky, um, and then if you sort of see this like a tip of this first failure, so that what you see is the car. Um, and then so that's what um, leads to how we evaluate the model. We call this tentatively the confidence car. Um, so this chart is actually, you know, the coming from one of the real enterprise software development team that we are working with. So again, just sort of like a recap on the X axis, like we are tracking the total amount of test execution time. Um, I believe in this case, it was like a hour or two. Um, and then, so if you do other things um, on the Y axis side, like you are catching, how quickly are we catching those regressions? So what this means is like 10% into this, let's say two hour testing. So that would be, um, if it's a 10% uh, into two hour, that would be what, the 20, 24 minutes? Um, we be catching the close to like 85, 90% of all the regressions. Um, so that's, I think it's pretty, you know, that's pretty, pretty good. Um, and uh, so the red line here is the baseline, which is like if you are executing tests in a random order, uh, we expect if we run 10% of the test, we expect to catch about the 35% of regressions to be found. Um, so, you know, in many data points in here, we can pull in this you know, time to force feedback to within like, you know, the, or improve that by order of magnitude at least. Um, so, and then, you know, we'll be still, you can still be running the whole test, right? We're just reordering things. So without necessarily reducing the confidence, uh, reducing the bar, you can still get, you know, you can just basically get the test results faster. So that's the, um, that's the, uh, that's the sort of the magic. Now, um, or you could sort of take one step further and say, you know, since if this is just a, let's say a pre-Mars, uh, pre-request validation, maybe it is okay to like cut this off after 90% and then, uh, well, let's say 20%. And at that point you have 90% confidence. So one in 10 times, like a, a regression that sweeps through, uh, into the master branch, which you know, on one hand, might find it might feel scary, but like you know, you'd be still running these periodic tests on the master branch to catch them. And then I also like you to think like, you know, how many tests, how many regressions are not getting caught in this test anyway, right? Like, let's face it, like none of us would ever feel comfortable, like just because our, all our test passes are the software is perfect, like nobody says that. So. I think it, it can be in many situations, it is the right trade-off. Um, so another way I think of this, um, perhaps if that helps, is I think of this as a way of squeezing, like a concentrating the juice, like in the fruit into the juice, like a more high, high density value. So like if you think about the test as a work, like you, take, you spend like a one, one hour worth of a computing cycle um, to get some interesting signal, like no one or two, two failures that gives you information. So what we are trying to do is really squeeze more of it. So instead of using, you know, one hour to get three signals, what if you can do that in three minutes to get three signals? Right? And then the, the model performance so far seems to be backing up that kind of number. And then when you can squeeze more workload, you know, you can, you can, do, you can do more with it. You, you could actually, for example, afford to have more tests um, and then only, you know, be running meaningful ones, or maybe you can save money, uh, or maybe, you know, there's, there's all sorts of just possibility here. So, um, the, uh, update, just to kind of wrap up this implementation detail part. So the way we do this, like one of the common questions I get, uh, maybe in part because I, you know, I, I did a CI server before that, is this another, is this another CI service? And the answer is no, right? Because I know that like, a lot of people have a very you know, custom made tailored build test environment. You know, some people involve physical machines, 
different architecture, you know, cloud, on-prem, all over the map. So what we do is, you know, we have a small agent program running on inside the people build process. Um, and then when, you know, when it time, comes time to execute tests on their side, let's say, you know, Maven about to run the unit tests, uh, we insert our own extension plugin, that sort of things. And then we basically like ask, hey, this is the new software I'm about to test. This is the Delta, this is the commit that is being to test. Like, and these are the tests I have and I'm considering to run. What are the right order of the tests and what are the right subset? And then like, that, that sends that information over to your service on the other side of the internet. And at Launchable, we run this in the server side that run, like, and run the inference on the model. And it goes back and say, okay, so in that case, like these are the tests that you should run. And then the test runner follow that, try to you know honor that order, and then send back the test results as they happen. And then in that way, we can notify people and all sorts of things down the road. Um, so that's sort of like how it works. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, right? So and then that's sort of like what I love about it. It's um, it, it just in some like it it packages it packages itself in such a simple form factor. Um, and tests are pretty, okay, you know, universally applicable in many domains of the software development. So now we have this like a role capability, like you know, where in your software development cycle like you won't apply. I think there's just so much opportunity here, right? Because you know, it's one, it's tech agnostic, yeah, you know, like unit tests. I, again, I'm, I know many many teams have you know, multi-hour unit tests, which is great. Like it's, um, they should be. Uh, they should be commended, but now they need to be dope. It's integration tests, system tests, all that tend to be more expensive. This technology doesn't care about that. You know, the front end, back end, mobile, like, you know, it doesn't matter. Different programming language, test tools, you know, like architecture, it, it, yeah, it just simply doesn't, it doesn't care what these different form factors are. Uh, all we need to know is the information that, that we sh said earlier, which is delta, and then the test behavior change. So. So just just to give you a few examples of you know like where we we find this to be useful. Well, one I kept talking about this pre more is like a pull request validation, right? Um, so this is actually the time in which developer actually often actively wait for a test result to come in. Uh, and okay, just just this morning I was working on this new PR and I got that in and I had to wait until the, the PR validation kicks in and I need to ping somebody to get the code review and then like you know, then, so. Right now, ours is not that long, uh, but you, you know, I know, I, I know you know this pain, uh, and we can we can help you there. Right? Or like if you are one of those places where you have the nightly integration tests, um, you have a big integration test suite, like a multi-hour, let's say five-hour test suite, and that's probably too long to run pre mod so you're probably having it running nightly or something. Um, and what happens is like you know, during the day, like you 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 push a change. Um, and then you go home, and then in the night the test is run, and then your change is, is fine to contain a regression. Then tomorrow morning, you come in your fresh mind, trying to work on something else. The first thing you see is a nasty gram for CI server saying, hey, your change didn't work out. So now you suddenly have to context switch back into what you just thought you finished uh, to, to keep on working on stuff to clean it up. That's really disruptive. I think I've done that many times. So, well, what if you can, you know, instead of wait, you waiting until the midnight, throughout the day, you can create a small adaptive subset, right? So, you know, we, we saw in those models, like just by 5%, 10% of the, um, the subset, we can get pretty good coverage. It's not gonna cover everything, but like at this way, if you're running a 10% um, subset at every 30 minutes, as opposed to one giant five hour unit test, you can pack that throughout the day. So the, suddenly the time to get the regression goes down, way down from you know, basically close to one day to within like, you know, the 18 minutes, less than 30 minutes, because within that 30 minutes time, we can still get you results pretty quickly. So I think that's a pretty, that, that's a pretty like a game changing story, I think for many software development team. And you know, remember, like this doesn't really need any massive rewrite, the architecture, anything. You can simply improve, like get more value out of the assets, the, the tests that you've, you know, you've worked so hard to build up 
and you, you just let you get more value out of it. And that's the that's the part of the story that I that I love. So another thing, uh, sort of like a taking this into the different angle is that um, as a developer, I felt like I always had this struggle of, you know, like I feel like I know what needs to be done. Or rather, like when I talk to the practitioners in those software development teams, they know what needs to be done. Um, and then like, you know, they, they come across like people who know what they're doing and I completely trust them and like they, it, it sounds legit, but often people struggle to get their organization to rally behind them. Right? Like, you know, when was the last time like you wanted to do some refactoring on the subsystem because you know it's error prone and needs to be, be done because it was built on the wrong assumptions. And then like the coolest product manager would come to say like, what does that buy me? You know, like, is that gonna give me like a hundred more, a hundred thousand more like a daily active users? And no, okay. So like you just, the, the challenge is like, and that, that to me is like a failure of the communication, the failure to explain, quantify the impact that let's say that refactoring would do in ways that other people in the organization would understand. And I sort of this the product manager uh, in, in that previous example, but really like they are doing the right thing. Like they, you know, they, they have no way, they are not expected and they have no way of knowing uh, that what you are trying to do would, would have what impact in different things. If not daily active users, what is it? Um, and then you know, developers, like we don't, we don't usually think you know, in those terms. So one of the missions I sort of like, we are trying to take on ourselves is to bridge that gap. I think it's the, it has to be the numbers who's, that, that speaks the impact. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, and this is not an easy challenge to try to translate the impact of let's say faster feedback time into productivity gain. Uh, but this is why we sort of introduced the notion of like time to first failure and be able to put some numbers in ways that would pass a sniff test or people who can actually rally the organization behind behind you. Um, so you know, this is one of your working screen, which you say, well, so you can create this daily uh, adaptive subset that runs throughout the day of the integration test. Like, what is the right frequency cycle to maximize? You know, the, on one hand, you can catch more regression if you run bigger subset. But then you'll be running it less frequently. So now the wait time is going to start to have impact. So there's somewhere in the middle where you get the right balance. So like, can we compute those things? You know, can we project those things so that we can help you assist that number? Um, or can we present the view that like, you know, what is by doing these things, like what is it doing to the overall productivity of the team? something you can take it to your boss and manager or the product manager so that they understand that this is in their interest. And you're, you're not just saying this because you want it to have fun doing the refactoring, et cetera. Um, so all of that results in, you know, we should, uh, the end result is we can actually translate these things into the number of the developers hours spent on waiting. Um, and then uh, the, how that cost, how that translate into the cost both in terms of the people time and the machine time. And those are again, the kind of numbers that can be, you know, can be used to rally the organization around. So that is the, what the sort of like gist of what we are working on. And I hope, um, I hope I managed to convince you that there is something real in here. So, you know, right now what we are doing is, this is, um, um, we are sort of like approaching this a little cautiously, right? I know like the build and test are often mission critical part of the software development team. And I've been a build guy myself or else I wouldn't be here. So when those things stop, like, you know, people, you know, people really get pissed off. And if, and that's bad enough, like if you silently sleep regressions and production blows up and then that's gonna be a big deal. So we are trying to work with the product advisors, like a small number of teams who are really feeling this pain and they're willing to spend time with us. Uh, and then, you know, we would deploy the program to collect these necessary data to simulate the model and then they estimate, evaluate the running impact, uh, impact of running the Antelope technology, you know, discuss where in the software development cycle we can make the biggest difference. Um, and then, you know, this really only involves like a relatively small time commitment from your, from your side. 
Um, and then we all look at the impact together. Like I showed one of these graphs, we do this with other teams. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's, it, you know, it's, it's less, it's, you know, it's, it's less than that. Um, and then we start slowly start to work toward the pilot deployment in which, you know, we still start, you know, start actually activating that. Your developers, your colleagues started, you can start using it. Um, and then, you know, we will make sure that the kind of numbers that we are producing help you make the case to you know, people who need to authorize these things. So um, I really think it's a, you know, the unique opportunity that when you get, you know, just by everyone we presented these things, like, and I got insights out of uh, what we found, like it's always good to have somebody objectively, you know, looking at what you're doing. And I'd like to think, you know, the people on the, in the company know a thing or two uh, about the build and test process. Um, and then you also get to influence and pilot the product and uh, yeah, influence the direction of the product rather, um, because, you know, we want to make sure that what we're building solves the challenges of people like you. So your feedback is vital and there's only so much we can tell you in this 30 minutes call, um, but there's a lot more opportunity to engage uh, so yeah, and then you know, in appreciation for your trust and confidence in us for and work spending time with us, we also wanted to return that favor to you. And and let's also face it, right? This product like this it grows over time. So you know, from, from for you to be with our journey from the very beginning, that means a lot to us. So uh, we we want to return that favor, right? You know, price and discount, other means like that, more time that we're spending. So that is the what we are looking trying to work on. Um, so yeah, like if you if you're interested in any of this, um, here's the contact information. And while I have this slide up here, I guess uh, yeah, let me let me bring it this back to uh, Drew. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Kosuke, for the presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. So the first one is from Madhavi, and he says, approximately how long does it take Launchable to come back with the set of tests that should be run against a build? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is something, um, this is something I'm trying to find. There's no, like, a rule of thumb because it depends on, like, how frequent and how big your team is. Uh, like, I have a, I have, you know, I have a one month project in which I only make like a one commit a month or a year or something. So, um, and then so it really depends. But so far, I think what we are finding is, you know, a few weeks of data seems to be good enough to kind of start to paint in the picture. Um, and then usually also, let's face it, the enterprise teams that we work with, like, never move fast enough. So, like, you, this data collection time hasn't really been the problem. It's, uh, Conversation in Fosek. Okay, just yeah. to fill in, I think what Madhavi is asking is not uh, the training time. Ah. It's actually the runtime when we have the system running and oh, you, oh. It, it calls in, and then <clears throat> how quickly do we come back with the result? Uh, the, the time it takes to do the inference. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Oh, boss, or well, a right, boss. Yeah, yeah. So the runtime, I think, is uh, it's negligible. Like you know, it's yeah, it's it's truly negligible. Um, if, I'm pretty sure, like, uh, yeah. So what was the number? I think it's like a one millisecond per test case or something, and it's, it's trivially parallelizable. So um, yeah, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be issue at all. Uh, training time, I think we already talked about. It's like a data set of several weeks. I think it's a good rule of thumb. And you know, with the giant task is saying, well, it really depends. Yeah. All right. So the the next question was like, can CI platform use Lunchable to offer their clients? Um, yeah. So I actually, so I think, yeah. So there there needs to be integration the different layers. In some sense, the CI platform isn't actually the primary integration point. It's more like a build tools and test framework, because we actually need to influence their behavior uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, change the order in which the tests run. So that's a higher mind. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, somewhere down the road, I'd imagine we'd be you know, smoothing, in order to smooth out the user experience and onboarding experience further, we'd be looking at some CI servers uh, for sure. I know a few of them. 
Okay, and Chris, oh. we have a couple other questions from the chat here. So um, Guillaume asks, how does this compare to say the Shopify approach or what some other companies like Google have baked using Bazel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great point. Actually, I didn't talk about this, but the part of the reasons I felt like this was, there's something real in here is I started hearing from you know, some, some friends and people I know from these big companies, Google being one of them, Facebook being another, that they are internally working on these systems and that exists and they are producing sizable impact, right? So I know, so that, that to me proves that it's doable. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, that, that reminded me of the days, back in the days when every big company had their own internal CI server unbeaten, right? Which is like, you know, they, they did so because they needed it, but it was completely senseless. Like, why, why would you spend your time doing that? And then I was, you know, I, I'd like to think I'm good at building a general, generalizable, general purpose solutions in this space, in the face of these enterprise complexity. Um, so when I saw that pattern, like, you know, clearly this is a, a real problem. I, 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 I talked to these people who have this problem. I have the same problem. And I've heard that this, this is a solvable problem. But if the Google and Facebook can do it, I see no reason why I can't do it. Um, so that was a key motivation, yeah. And these companies, let's face it, they never produce something that that be, be usable outside their firewall. Right? They just operate such a, uh, they just operate on such a customized tech stack on top of their internal infrastructure that there's just no hope of uh, that being useful. Like which of the in-house CI server has grown into dominate the market? No, right. So general purpose solution needs to be built into general purpose solution from the beginning, and that's sort of like how I believe it. All right. Okay. Um, so Bob asked, what changes do I need to make to my code and test suite to be able to work with Launchable? We use PHP unit. Does it work with that? Right. So yeah. So the, another goal is to really minimize the intrusion into people's build and test process. So, you know, if we, some of that depends on the details of the language and platform, but you know, we don't think we need to ask you to change any of the tests or how they run. Uh, we just need to produce some plugins extensions to, if it's a PHP unit, I actually don't know what to, yeah, so the, I don't know exactly how to insert ourselves into that one, but it's just a matter of writing it. And then the good thing is like, these are all open source tools. So we should be able to, we should be able to work with these people to make a necessary hook. And I know many already do, like Maven as well. Okay, and Neb asks, how much CPU and memory are required or is that not an issue here? There's a follow-up question, but I'll, I'll pause for a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, on people's, on your side, there's really no, no memory and CPU requirement whatsoever. Um, basically, basically zero. I mean, again, it's really just a sorting the list of tests and, you know, and that's so small, like, um, it, it's not worth talking about it. But on our side, it's a different story because we have to deal with this relatively large amount of data and model and stuff like that. But you know, that's not something you probably care about. Okay. He also asks, do you perform all testing processing locally on users' computers instead of in the cloud? So, yeah. So the idea is like, we are not going to ask you to move your test elsewhere. So if you are running your tests locally, I assume like a locally, like on-prem data center or like some you know, have your physical servers connected to uh, embedded devices or something, you, you keep running it there. If your workload is on cloud, then obviously you're gonna keep it running there. All, all we need to, you know, all we need in that environment is like a teeny bit that's gonna reorder the tests and then everything else, all the actual brain is on our side of the hosted service. So that's, so there's no need to, you know, upload the source code. I know it's a, uh, well, actually, yeah, so yeah, we don't need to see the binaries. Uh, we do need to see the source code. I think I mentioned that, let me be careful here because um, the line is fine here. So we don't need to see the content of the source code. Uh, we do need to see the metadata around them. You know, the, the, that, that is what I call that the commit graph, you know, file pass, date of change, who made the change, that kind of things. Uh, and then so far, yeah, so, yeah, so let, let, let's leave it that way. So it's kind of a nuanced answer. Okay. 
Jesse asks, does the selection of tests support parallelized test runners? If I'm already sharding my test runs across 10 build machines, mm -hmm. can the web service assign prioritized tests for each machine, say in a round robin fashion? Uh, uh, Jesse, um, so let's see. Um, let me see, so if I'm sharding the tests. Yeah, so um, I think, I think the way to think about this is the, the guidance that we are providing is essentially like an ordering relationship within the tests, right? So if you already have a shower, it's like you decided to split them. I mean, you, you, I think, I mean, you could, you could go one or two ways, I suppose. Like you can locally sort within the shower. And that's, you know, that, I think that's, there is nothing that should prevent you from doing that. Or we could sort and then you can shard, which I think has like a some, uh, you should have some minor difference in the performance. Um, of course, like, you know, the, the in, interacting with sharding, I mean, it, it also depends on like at what layer you're doing the sharding. Uh, like, is it a part of the build tool or something you build outside? So some of those details, it's going to influence the way, you know, the actual integration would work. Uh, but, you know, like we, our plan is like the client side of this should be all open source. So with somebody like Jesse's caliber, like I see no problem, like you'd be able to stitch things together in the right way. Um, if you have, the question is, can we do it in theory or no, then obviously the answer is yes. Okay. Rahul asks, can you list plugins and integrations you've implemented for each build tool? Uh, can we list the plugins? So that is something in progress. In other words, like, I, you know, our priority is not at the moment to go wide. We know it's doable. Um, to me, it's not the risky part. We, you know, I think the, 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 the part that we are trying to prove is like this technology, actually, well, people, there are enough people who have this problem and uh, as we think they are, and then, you know, we can solve this problem for these people you know as, as we as we as we claim we are um and then like to be able to show this data in ways that would convince the stakeholder um so that's the part that we really need to prove and that's what we are working on i feel like if you can prove that this is doable with let's say you know php units since that shows up in the conversations then to me it's like it's just a matter of quote unquote typing it in to support all the other build tools and test framework so um you know, we part of the reason we are having this product advisor conversations is so that we can we can work with you to prioritize the right integrations. Okay. Yeah. Just, just to complete there, uh, so as part of the product advisor program, uh, we are going in and building those integrations. So the the folks we have worked with, we have actually gone in and built those integrations today. Thank you, Harpreet. Uh, Jesse also asked, are historically flaky tests automatically detected and deprioritized, less likely to integrate, integrate a real regression? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we do, I think, so this, this, this should be, well, we want to look, look into this more, more carefully because there's all sorts of values here. Um, you know, we think it's pretty straightforward to detect the flakiness in this manner. Because after all, those are relatively or frequently failing tests, so that's going to pick up. Now, what to do with them is actually less obvious. Um, and then that, that, that depends on what your team wants to do with the flakiness. Um, so there's like some, some teams seems to be in a mindset where like, you know, they still hold the bar to all test passing. So in those cases, it's actually preferable to prioritize those flakiness um, uh, and so that like, you know, they can be rerun, et cetera. In some other cases, um, like we, we want to use that to control, I think, adaptively control how many times we rerun the tests uh, and before like we declare the, this actual failure or, or flake. Um, in some other places, they just accept the fact that some flakeness do exist, so they rather just suppress that noise. So there, I think we'd be looking at deprioritizing them. So this is actually one of the kind of key points of the conversation in trying to have these different product advisors. Yeah. Okay, and Prabud asks, do you use launchable test prioritization and selection internally for your product too, <laughs> doing dog fooding kind of testing? Uh, uh, so the, actually the short embarrassing answer is right now we don't. Um, it's, uh, we don't, um, our, our product is actually pretty new and then we don't have enough 
manifest this peak of I am kind of ashamed to admit that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's suffice to say it's on their roadmap. I think it'd be embarrassing if you don't in, in pretty short order. <laughs> so, so thanks for pushing that up in your priority. Kosuke, one common question that we get is like, when you select a test, is that a static set of tests or like do they change based on changes coming in? Right, okay. Yeah, so I think it's worth calling out once again that the, the whole point of this is that the, the the tests that are ordered is based on what has changed. So we expect, you know, depending on different area in the code chain, it's going to create the different subset, different order. And that's what makes this more interesting than, let's say, static notion of the smoke test that many people use. Right? Okay. Any other final thoughts or questions? I don't see anything else here in the chat or the Q&A. All right. Okay. Well, we thank everyone for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. Uh, as Kosuke had mentioned, we are currently signing up product advisors. So if what you saw today in the Launchable Solution resonates with you, we do have a sign up link on our website. And so please subscribe to the invite to beta and we'll be in touch to discuss our engagement model. Thanks everyone. Cool. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.